1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to look at uh, verses 13 through 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Uh, this is one of the great uh, scriptures that talk about uh, the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, Comfort one another with these words. I think sometimes in uh, in Christianity, I, I I think verse eighteen should be modified to wherefore uh, scare everybody with these words. Because when a lot of people think about the return of Christ or the rapture, it it scares a lot of people. This is designed to be something comforting. Um, man, I'm ready to go home, and and, and that's not America. <laughs> That's not the man's. I'm ready to go home. And and uh, these, uh, this church in Macedonia and Thessalonica, um, they suffered persecution. They suffered problems. They saw uh, Christians who were persecuted unto death. They saw those that that had died, and and uh, there was a lot of problems. You know, in today's world, um. We have people that keep on trying to tell us when the Lord's going to return. You know, it says, well, on this date, the Lord's going to return. And uh, I, I had this one person actually email me and explain to me uh, all the reasons why that the Lord is going to return on this particular date. I said, I've got a better prophecy for you. One that will happen 100%. He said, well, what's that? I said, I said, the Lord won't return on that day. <laughs> and then you're going to email me back and you're going to explain how you got your calculations wrong. And then you're going to give a new date. And then he won't come back on that date either. And then you won't ever contact me again because you're too embarrassed. <laughs> and I want you to know. When, when I got that, that next email uh, after the Lord didn't return and after the person did the refiguring, I said, listen, I don't want my third prophecy that you, you'll never contact me again, but uh, it, there's a reason why Jesus says no man know at the time. You know, it, it wasn't no man know at the time except for you if you could figure out the secret code. And by the way, the secret code is not a day to the Lord. It says a thousand years and a thousand years it says a day. Man, that's, that's the dumbest thing ever. Um, but, but yeah, we, we have, we have these and, and we have, um, I think there's, I think the part of the reason why false teaching enters into churches is because people aren't willing to say, hold on a second. I love you, but that's not scripturally right. I, I think that in the, in the desire not to offend anybody or stick our own necks out, or maybe we think that maybe somebody studied more than we have. Um, we let so much false things enter into the church. And in some ways, we're more worried about offending man than we are offending God. I mean, um, <clears throat> I have a, I make no, no bones about this. I'm answerable to God for everything that I teach. That's, that's frightening. It really is. I've got to sometimes, man, uh, when I'm annoyed about something, I've got to make sure, man, don't, don't fit your annoyances in with the scripture. You know, make sure you're just preaching the word. And, uh, and sometimes God will bring it so that uh, the scripture and the events going on will merge. But um, 
but I have to be careful that we have to be make sure that we uh, we rightly divide the word of truth. Well, in uh, in chapter four, verse thirteen, it's we're talking about the rapture of the church. Uh, I'll get into this more, but I'm not talking about the second coming of Christ. I'm not talking about that. Just very simply, um, the way I'm, I'm convinced of Scripture, the way the prophetic calendar works out, is soon and very soon, there'll be the rapture of the church. And, and the believers on earth will be gone, and uh, even more mysterious, the bodies that are in graves that belong to believers will also go, and it will be a tremendous event. Then that will signal, and I don't know, I, I don't think it'll start right at that time period, but, but then the events of the man of sin uh, coming onto the political scene, and, and, uh, and then the seven years of tribulation will, will start, and halfway in the middle of that is uh, is going to be when the Antichrist breaks his covenant, breaks his covenant with Israel, and desecrates the third temple that's going to be made. It's it's not there now. Um, and then at the end of those seven years, the end of those seven years of tribulation, Christ will return with his saints to set up his kingdom. That kingdom will last for a thousand years. And then at the end of that time, there'll be one last free will event where humanity, sadly, still tries to overthrow Christ. And everything is stopped there. The nations will be judged. Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire. Man, I hope he lets me kick him at least once before he gets there. I sure wouldn't mind that. Um, the nations will be judged. Um, the Big Bang will happen. I know we spoke about creation on Sunday, but I'm a firm believer in the Big Bang. It just hasn't happened yet. The Bible says that one day the worlds will, uh, uh, the heavens and the earth will be destroyed with a loud noise. Sounds like a Big Bang to me. And uh, so the Big Bang just hasn't happened yet. And uh, and this earth and and the uh, and literally everything, including heaven, is just going to be absolutely wiped out. Uh, the only thing that seems to uh, remain that we see at the end of the book of the Revelation is we'll see. Do you remember when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also? In Revelation, we see this, this city coming down. And, and it is called his bride. And that seems to be, biblically speaking, that seems to be the place that Christ made for his uh, believers from the resurrection to the, tribu to, the, uh, to the rapture, that those are his bride. It doesn't mean that uh, pre-resurrection saints are second-class citizen or post-tribulation saints our second-class citizens. We're not saying any of that. We're just saying that it seems to be different. The Bible says that uh, the city, uh, uh, like his bride, uh, is coming down. And I, I, I kind of take that a little bit literal. And, um, <clears throat> and that seems to be the only thing that's going to survive because I think that's the only place Satan doesn't put his nasty feet on. Everything else, Satan is... Uh, uh, made foul... I know, I know we have an expression that God cannot allow sin in his presence. But we do read in Job that Satan has been in his presence. And he goes into his presence and he, he accuses us before him. Um, but then he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth uh, where, where things are going to be right. We're going to be able to freely take of uh, the tree of life. We're going to be able to freely drink from living waters. Um, of course, with that understanding, 
I want to bring the people that I love with me, <laughs> you know. And uh, I told one loved one, I said, you know, heaven's just not going to feel as sweet without you there. And uh, I, I think there's going to be a time that he wipes away all tears from her eyes. And, and I always thought, what is it going to be like? You know, obviously the tears from her eyes are going to be removed. I, I think because we understand the judgment that the world is under and maybe the, the thoughts, the perfect thoughts of, did we waste too much time? But then I, there's a time that he'll wipe away those tears. And, and I always thought, you know, will we be upset when at the great white throne of judgment? By the way, Christians, you're not going to be judged at the great white throne of judgment. That's not going to happen. Your sins have already been judged. We will be at the judgment seat of Christ where we won't be judged. Our rewards will. And rewards are going to be passed out. It's interesting that um, some of the description is, is that it's like a house, wood, hay, stubble, and uh, precious jo uh, gold, silver, and precious stones. And then it's all, could you imagine the hodgepodge of what our houses are going to look like? You know, it's just going to look so weird. And, uh, and it, it's what needs to go is going to go. What hasn't been right uh, is going to go. And then we're going to have rewards. The purpose of the rewards is to cast them at our Savior's feet. But I always thought, I wonder what it's going to feel like to see people judge at the great white throne of judgment. It's going to have to be heartbreaking. And I had a Christian friend. We, I mean, we're sometimes we think, <laughs> you know, and, and, and we, we were talking about thinking about it. And he said, maybe not. Why would you say that? He says, well, our minds will be changed. We'll be like Christ. And maybe we will view sin as to be righteously judged like he does. Not that I don't think he's gleeful about it, but I, th I think there's certainly uh, some different things. So, so that's, uh, that's kind of the end events. I don't plan on living uh, for any of those terrible things. I, I plan on uh, either dying here on earth and to be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord, or... Uh, when that trump is sound, I'm, I'm going home to be with the Lord forever. And there seems to have been some debate about this. Now, by the way, there's some different views of eschatology. Can I use that big word, eschatology? It's the study of end times. And there's some people that are premillennial. Uh, that means that we believe that the rapture of the church will happen before the millennial reign starts. There are some that are post-millennial uh, post that believes the tribulation will start at the end of the uh, millennial kingdom. And there's some that are all millennial, uh, which is that basically it's, it's all kind of an allegory. Uh, that's the one I really struggle with the most. And I've got good friends that are on that side. I struggle with that the most because uh, what is it an allegory for? Whenever somebody wants to say something's in the Bible, uh, like somebody said, well, you know, the rich man and Lazarus. Remember the, the, that, that story, the rich man and Lazarus, Jesus told, and he says, the rich man went to hell. And they said, well, all that's just a parable. I said, well, we can't dismiss it because now we actually have to double down on it. Because whenever Jesus spoke in a parable, he would take a real event. A guy was digging in a field. Somebody went out to fish. A woman lost a coin. And so if this is a parable, he's now confirming that this is a real event that can happen. Um, and it's a... Uh, uh, and then what would it be a parable for? What would hell be a representation for? Do you, you, you get where I'm going with this? I, I think sometimes we, because we're a little bit nervous about what it might mean, um, we get concerned about 
just reading the Bible like it is. And sure enough, there are some things in the Bible that is comparative, is uh, some things are allegorical, but it's, it, it's very well known that it is. You know, when it's, it, it, it'll make a, a representation of this, this, that, and the other, and then Jesus will define what each one of these things mean. The Bible doesn't just leave it alone like that. And uh, so we at Brimpton Baptist Church, we hold to a premillennial return of Christ, premillennial rapture. We also uh, will hold to a pre-tribulation uh, view of the rapture. There are some that um, hold to a pre-wrath that we will be here, but as soon as God's wrath is poured down on the earth during the tribulation, will be taken. There's some that believe that in the middle, uh, the three and a half years, the church will be taken. And there's some that believe at the end of the tribulation, after we've been slapped around enough, then we get to go. Uh, I, I, and I'm going to try to show from here, and I, I think I'll be able to finish it tonight, but if not, we'll just uh, continue this next week. Um, but uh, I think this passage itself is a very unique passage. Because when Jesus spoke about his coming, I want you to think for a moment and maybe answer. When Jesus spoke about his coming, when Jesus spoke about all the things that will happen in end times, when the book of the Revelation talks about things that will happen in the end times, can you guys just give me some words that would describe those things? Okay, which uh, totally given over to evil, and and uh, and also things will be kind of normal, Give, marrying and given into marriage. Yeah, what what are some other ways? I mean, it, you don't have to be a Bible scholar. Just think real broad. Pleasant. Is it going to be pleasant? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so there does seem to be, hey, <laughs> it seem, we seem to be getting closer, closer. At least the Western world is arguing for that. Um, it, if you think about what Jesus spoke, spoke about, like in Matthew, it's, it's about uh, judgment, uh, condemnation, nations being judged. But in this passage, there's none of that. As a matter of fact, in this passage, there's no judgment whatsoever. There's just Christ receiving his church. And when Paul gives this, he's saying what was a mystery before, I'm now going to explain it to you. So in, in chapter 4, verse 13, it says, But I would not have you to be ignorant. I guess whenever you call somebody ignorant, you then have to say, but we're brothers. I still love you because ignorant is usually not a nice term. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now, I, I just need to say this. People get nervous about reading the book of the Revelation. Oh, I can't read that. It's too confusing. Do you realize that there's only one book of the Bible that God says he's actually going to give a special blessing when you read it. And, and what has the devil told us? You can't read that book. Don't read that one. Read all the other ones. Don't read that one. I mean, uh, I, I'm a very firm believer that God wrote things down so that we don't need all these maps. We don't need all these things. We don't need special conferences. I actually believe that he wrote things down in a way in which we could just understand them. Isn't that silly? <laughs> I mean, j just think about that. Isn't, uh, it, it, isn't that who God is? When, when he wrote these things, when he spoke about prophecy, uh, he wrote them so that we could understand them. I, I think sometimes we, we confuse things. And, and it says, you know, again, at the beginning of the verse, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, We've got to be informed about this subject because being ignorant of something 
in our Christianity will always be detrimental to our proper walk. Always. Um, sometimes we might have a hard time understanding something. Whenever somebody says, oh, I just don't understand this. I'll never will. I'm like, stop. Slow down. Let's look at it. I'll be with you the whole entire time, but the only thing I will not accept is I'll never understand it. I used to be a teacher. All right, and, and, and when a student would say, I'll never get it, now is my per personal mission to make sure you got it. And, uh, and that's, that's important. And what's important is that if you don't understand something in Scripture, dig in the Word. Uh, don't avoid it. Now it says, the, the whole thing starts here, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Um, this is for the people who've died. Okay, the body is asleep. We do not believe in soul sleep. Why? Because the Bible says absent from the body is what? Present with the Lord. There is a separation of those two things. The body is asleep, but not their soul. Look in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. Got to get the glasses. 2 Corinthians. And as we're looking at this, I also want to say that um, you can be a good Christian and have different views of things. I've got a, a great friend who's does a lot of uh, does a lot of content for YouTube, and uh, and we're we're still friends even though we don't see eye to eye on this. And uh, but he'll 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 get it there. Second <laughs> um, Corinthians five verse eight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. There is a, there's a promise. Now, what is the purpose of our bodies? Glad you asked. Look in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. You might, did you ever wonder, what are we going to look like in heaven? What's it going to be like? Will we, uh, will we know each other? What, you know, will, will I get a better looking face? Will I be skinnier? Are we going to be around the age 33 that, you know, uh, that Jesus was when he died? You know, there's all these questions, right? Well, Paul's kind of answering these things. And again, like I said, there, we're covering a lot of territory. I'm not going to rush it. If this takes a couple of weeks to do, we'll, we'll, we'll do it that way. But anyways, he says in verse 35, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 35, he says, but some will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Okay, so the question is, see, the ancient people weren't stupid, all right? So when somebody is buried, what happens to their bodies? They decompose, right? So like, some of the question was, do you need a body? Some of the things that uh, the Church of England used to do when it would persecute those uh, that, um, that wanted the English translation of the Bible that um, said Lord's Supper was for only believers, um, that infant baptism didn't count. I mean, we have, we have history in this country that some of those uh, believers that spoke about that were burned at the stake. You've heard about that. This is, this is actual. Um, if you ever want to take a trip to Chester, I'll go to Chester with you, and we can go to see... Uh, were one of the martyrs in Fox's Book of Martyrs, also called Acts and Monuments. Uh, by the way, coolest thing when I was in Manchester getting my, my master's, I got to handle a uh, first edition of that. And it's, yeah, yeah, it's really cool. But anyways, um, and, uh, and I could take you to the place where he was burned by the river, and then they got his ashes. And uh, actually with his ashes, they just dumped in the um, in a leper pit. 
Other times they would grab these ashes and who did they do that with? Was it Wycliffe or Tyndale? Tyndale. They got his ashes and they threw it over the river. And the reason why they did it is if he doesn't have a body, he can't be resurrected. Hmm? Even if he's right, God can't do anything with him. And that's, that's the thinking, you know, and I remember as a kid, man, if you got eaten by a lion, it, you know, and then the rat would, would part of your molecules that made up that, that lion now, would it get ripped out of them, you know, or, or if, uh, or, you know, <laughs> just things you think about as a kid. Um, I died and somebody had my heart. And the rapture happened. When I get my heart back, what would happen to them? You know, the, these type of things go on. Well, they, they had some of these questions. You know, the, you know, the question that they had is, uh, how, are the, how does this even happen? And with what body do they come? And Paul very lovingly says, fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. In other words, um, when you plant a seed, it doesn't, the process doesn't happen very fast. It's a slow process. I'm always reminded when I was a kid, we all did the little seed in the cup, get a little thing going, and mine never sprouted. Never. Because every day I'd dig it up and it wouldn't go and put it back and dig it up and go. And apparently there was a problem with that. But uh, I've, I've been re redoing some grass seed over there and and, but it's coming, but, but, but Paul says it's just sowing and reaping. It, it, it's not an automatic process. It has to die. Now, verse 37, And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it has pleased him, and to every seed his own body. Now, this might sound confusing, but it'll all make sense in a second, I promise you. All flesh, verse 39, is not the same flesh. There is one kind of flesh for men, another flesh of beasts, another fishes, another of birds. There are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another of the stars, and one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption and raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor and raised in glory. It is sown in weakness and raised in power. It is sown a natural body and raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Now, let's, let's skip to verse 48. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as it is the heavenly, such are that which is heavenly. Verse 49. And as they have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. <sighs> Pastor, what's the point? All right, great verses. But man... My brain now hurts just thinking about all that. Very simply. When you get an apple seed, does that look like an apple tree? Nope. Does it look like an apple? Nope. Now, I know all seeds look different, but the point is, is that what's planted it's not just a mini version of what's going to come out. Make sense? The point the scripture is making here is we are buried. Our bodies is a seed. Just to, don't, don't take this uh, illustration too far, okay? It's just an illustration. But he says we're, we're, we're going to be planted and it's going to be earthly, but then we're going to be celestial. And just like a seed is going to look far different than what it's going to be, our bodies that are planted are going to look way different than what we're going to be. And I don't know if we're going to have hands. I don't know if we're going to have feet. I don't know exactly what's going on. Uh, maybe we still will have 
that. Maybe there's some descriptions in the Bible, you know. I don't know. I just know it's going to be so amazingly different. I know that, um, I remember uh, my wife and I were, were studying this and talking about this. And, uh, and she says, uh, uh, and that she was, she was a, a new Christian. And she says, I love it that we're going to be married forever. I went, no, we're not. And I think I said a little bit too emphatic because uh, it was kind of, I didn't mean it that way, but I certainly said it that way. And it was more like, no, it's not that I don't want to be married to you. That's not what I meant. It was more like, no, that's not what the scripture says. Heaven is neither marrying nor given in marriage, right? We are, we are going to be free. Uh, I, one of my favorite uh, verses is when these Pharisees, no, scribes try to get Jesus in a little trap. And they said, well, okay. So this man was married to this one woman, and he died, and his brother married her, and then he died. And then the other brother married her, and then he died, and the fourth married her, and he died. And then all, all seven brothers ended up marrying her. I'm thinking already, I think there needs to be a police investigation if all these guys are dying so fast. But, um, and then the scribe said, so, who's she going to be married to in heaven, buddy? And Jesus says, you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God because heaven is not marrying and giving in marriage. We are the bride. He is the groom. He is the husband. We are for him. Our whole purpose was to be his bride. Um, I know sometimes that uh, people have uh, you know, said, I don't like it that uh, Christians are all called sons of God. Isn't that kind of misogynistic? Well, if I got to be called the bride of Christ, you got to be called the <laughs> sons of God, right? It's it's just it's fair. It's fair, okay? So, um, so all these things are going on, and and uh, and the the question that Christians had then is, what's going on with the people that are dying? And he says. I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those people that have died. We're back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. He's not saying that it's wrong to weep at a Christian's funeral. It's fitting. But we, we don't sorrow in the same way when somebody, when you go to the funeral of somebody that's hopeless. Have you ever been to a Christian funeral? It can be quite pleasant. It can be just, it can be fun. I, I know it's weird to even say that, but I've done enough funerals where I look forward to a Christian's funeral that really the person loved Jesus and those around them loved Jesus and they're just celebrating and they're, they're, they're just giving testimonies of, of what, what they've seen the Lord do in life and, and how they've served together. And it's great. And so, and so, Paul says here that Christian, it's okay to sorrow, but don't sorrow like others that have no hope because we do have hope. Why would he even need to bring that up? The culture around them. You know, some of them taught, look, when you're dead, you're dead. Nothing's going to happen. And so sometimes we can be affected or infected by the culture around us. And so Paul says, I want to teach you something. I want to teach you about those which are asleep in Christ. Now again, it's just their bodies. It's a nice way of saying that they kick the bucket. They pop their clocks. Uh, but they're with the Lord. I, I promise you, I, I hope I don't want to die anytime soon, but if, I'm, if I die and you see me in the casket, and I've told my kids this, that is not dad. That's just dad's mortal husk. That's just my shell. I'm not there at all. And, it's, and I know humanly, you know, we, we like the funeral. We like the, the last goodbye. We like the burial because it kind of brings closure. But the reality is I'm not going to be at rest at the end of my funeral. I'm already at rest right away. I'll even say this, sometimes I think that people are kept on life support system 
but their soul's already gone. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not a doctor, but uh, I, I think that. I really do. I, th I think that it's not just a heart going back and forth because we could keep a heart going for millions of years, whatever. But it's, it really is that, that when that person is dead, their soul goes. And he says, look, yeah, we're sad when believers go because you're missing a friend. I remember when our daughter, when she abandoned us because she hated us and wanted to go to university and she, oh, it hurt us so much. And we wept. I mean, we, we didn't weep until we started walking away and then we just started sobbing. And I couldn't imagine sobbing worse at her funeral. And, and it kind of put things in perspective for me that, that we sorrow, but there's still a hope that I'll see her again. It's all right. We're okay. For Christians, we don't need to sorrow like somebody has no hope because we'll see them again. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That word if is since. For since we believe since we since we had the facts that and that we believe that Jesus died and rose again gospel right there what is the gospel good works no believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved we believe that jesus died and rose again and it's not just simply knowing the facts it's internalizing this that he is your savior for if we believe that jesus died and rose again even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Even so, because the person is trusted in the resurrected Savior, even so they will also experience the same resurrection. Christian, um, you're going to be resurrected one day. You're going to be resurrected just like Christ. I, I wonder what that means. Uh, again, with, with other preachers, uh, I can sometimes uh, talk about things in theory way out there and uh, just, just to get the discussion going. And, uh, you know, and I wonder, you know, if, if you got beheaded, you know, for your cause of Christ, you know, or when, when you go to heaven, you're going to have to sew that thing on? No. No, right? If you get, uh, if, if you get set on fire, are you going to be all crusty? No. No. I think... Um, I think Jesus is going to look far different than, than what we think. I think he will have a perfect body. Um, I, I know they look upon him who was slain or the land that was slain before the foundation of the world. Um, but I'm not exactly sure if he has scars. I mean, if he does, that's great. I, and I know we sing, I shall know him by the prince of the nails in his hands. I mean, that's a great song. But... With a resurrected body, is it possible that he may not have scars? Maybe. Well, yeah, but what about Thomas, who said, I'm not going to believe it's Jesus unless I stick my hands in his finger and his side. Well, yeah, remember, he didn't believe Jesus resurrected from the dead. There's the problem. He, he didn't have a great idea of what a resurrected Savior was. He just could not believe that Jesus would get out of the cave. And so he says, I need to go inside you know, his wounds to make sure it's really the guy in there. And, uh, and by the way, Jesus said, behold my hands, see my side. And we don't see Thomas sticking fingers anywhere, which is interesting. If you go to um, Rome, you'll find this out later. I'm, I'm kind of a Rome nut. I, I, I do tours at Rome all the time, and I do it for the Bible College. But, but they've got a, uh, uh, um, they've got Thomas, oh, they say it's Thomas's finger. Got Thomas's finger, you know. Uh, they, well, I mean, I, I think they know where Thomas is. I think he was in India, and he is in India, and surely that guy is missing his finger because Rome said we want that, and they took it over. And uh, but that finger probably never went in anything because I, I just think the resurrection is perfect. Now, if we're in heaven and we go, nope, see, he has wounds. I'm going to go. He's right. I'm wrong. 
Um, but I think our resurrection is going to be perfect. And those that previously died before this event are before their death, excuse me, before the resurrection, before the second, uh, I want to make sure I say this right, before the rapture, not the second coming, the rapture, they are immediately in the presence with the Lord. Um, and again, this is not speaking about the second coming of Christ. This is speaking about the rapture of the church. Go to John chapter 14, please. John chapter 14. We're getting to deep waters tonight, aren't we? <laughs> John chapter 14. Verses, starting with verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now, this statement is either 100% true or 100% blasphemous. Jesus is saying in John chapter 14, verse 1, he says the same way in which you believe in God, believe also in me. Now, could you imagine? Could you imagine if I said, hey, guys, listen. The same way you believe in God, I want you to believe in me, Damian Pickett. You guys would have me run out on, with pitchforks and torches or at least get my head examined, right? You'd say something is wrong here. And Jesus says, if you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. We do understand what a mansion is, right? Don't think Beverly Hillbillies. Remember that, you know, swimming pool, movie stars, the big old 22 room house, this, this word mansion. Well, look at the beginning in my father's what house in his house are what many mansions. The word mansion just means flats, apartments, sections, rooms. It's what it's always meant, but, uh, but rich people. They started calling their really fancy places mansions because they say this is just as good as anything you get in heaven. And that's how mansion kind of got switched over. If, if you're not sure, you can go to London and you can see apartment buildings, flats, called mansions. And, and oh, okay, I get the word now. Uh, We've got to make sure that we understand the terminology that it was written in. He says, in my father's house are many rooms, mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Um, Christ's return uh, will return for us for the express purpose of bringing believers to his dwelling. Now, some people I remember one time I was explaining this to somebody and they got very upset and go, well, you can have a little room if you want, but I'm going to have a big mansion. I want, man, you're excited about the wrong thing. You see what Jesus is saying? It's like, God loves you so much that you get to live with him forever. Not on the outskirts, with him and not in the guest house. You're part of his house. Man, the, the nicest thing people can do is to invite you over, and then if, if you don't have a place to stay, they say, oh, well, next time you come over, stay with us, please. We'll, we'll clear you out a room. But when somebody says, man, I want you to live with me forever, that says something, and, and that's what is being said here. Now remember, this can't be the the rapture of the church cannot be confused with the second coming because the second coming is so Christ can set up his earthly kingdom. His rapture is set up so that he can bring believers to his father's house. There's two different events being here. Um, and during there's going to be an interval between the rapture and the second coming, and this is called the judgment seat of Christ. You can look at that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 
First Corinthians chapter three, verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay that uh, than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, the foundation of Jesus Christ, by the way, what, what do you put on a foundation? A house, a building. Oh, yeah, yeah, very good. Okay. So uh, when we build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so by, as by fire. Um, so there is going to be a, uh, the judgment seat of Christ. In, in some translations, they don't call it the judgment. Um, they call it the bima. And the bima seat would have been used in Olympics. Um, it's a high seat, so you can see the events that are going on, and the judges sit there. And it's an unobstructed view, so they can make sure nobody is cheating. They can make sure that nothing is hidden. And they can call it out. And so when this is called the judgment seat of Christ, this is where Jesus says, look, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to examine what you've done. Do you ever get frustrated because um, this person acts one way over here, but when they uh, get into church, they seem to behave themselves or vice versa? Um, you know, and we get frustrated or, or, or we go, man, something needs to be done with that person. Have no fear. Jesus is the great judge. By the way, he's the great judge for you too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. some people say, oh, no, I can't believe everybody's going to see what I've done. I'll be honest with you. I think everybody's going to be too concerned about themselves. I don't, <laughs> I don't, think, I don't think I'm going to go, oh, shame on you. I'm going to go, oh, man, I did that too. I'm in trouble. And, and it's, it's our works. Our works are, um, and it doesn't seem like it's all going to be spelled out. I remember this one preacher said, um, said, look, when you die, you're going to go before the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be like a big screen TV, and everybody's going to see everything you ever did. Like, but the Bible doesn't describe it that way. It just says that our work, works are going to look like wood, hay, stubble, or gold. You know, some things that last or don't last, and it's going to go with fire. And You know, I, I'll tell you, what's even nice is this is a little bit comforting for me because we, we burn a lot of wood and, and things out there, you know. And... Uh, there's some things that have metal in there, and I didn't know it had metal. And everything's burnt up, but I go, oh, look at this, right? Or, or there's a hinge or something. It survives. The things that you've done for Christ will last. They're, they're not going to go away. I, I, I know we, we look at the, the, the what's going to be gone, I want you to think, even more importantly, you do have gold in your account. You do have silver in your account. You do have precious gems. And uh, I just want to stress, nobody's going to leave there saying, whew, yeah, look at me. Everybody's going to go, cool. Um, but what is the whole purpose of this? The whole purpose is that we can cast crowns. We can, uh, we can reward our Lord Jesus Christ for his goodness. Um, oof. I'm going to stop there. There's no way I'm, I'm going to be able to finish verse 15 before 10 p.m. tonight. So I'm going to stop here. And, uh, and I, again, we haven't gotten that far. We've just gotten to the basic premise um, that um, there is going to be a rapture of the church. There's no doubt about that. And it's not a scary event. 
for those that know Christ. It's, I get to go home. Um, one of my kids, they were out in the back garden and they were just jumping up and down. And I said, what are you doing? Are you jumping up and down? Dad, we're not jumping up and down. We're having rapture practice. Trying to get up there. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, let's, let's look forward to that blessed hope. Next week, we'll, we'll continue with verse 15 and on. Uh, but again, please remember verse 18 in your head. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. These words are not designed to be terrifying. These words are designed to give us absolute comfort. Amen?